Hi friends, welcome to Classic Education's YouTube channel. Uh, let us learn new concept today. Uh, today we will try to understand the election process of President of India. How the President of India is elected uh, in the Indian democratic setup, right? What is the you know uh, qualifications required for the uh, presidential candidate? Okay, who votes in the presidential election? Uh, what are the terms of office of the uh, president of India. Okay, we will try to understand all these concepts today. Okay, uh, as you know, uh, India is on the. Uh, it is now uh, le electing its new president now uh, because the pres present president, that is, uh, Sri Ramanath Kovind, his a uh, term of office is ending. So in our democratic setup, after every five years, you, we must elect the president of India. So we are in that process and recently the election commission of India has announced the dates for conducting the elections to the post of president of India. Okay. Now, so this was in the news. The five year term of the current president ends on the July 24. This year on 24th of July, the uh, uh, Ramnath Kovindji's term will end. Okay. Because of the uh, <coughs> termination or end of the his tenure. Uh, now we are electing. So the election commission of India has announced the 16th presidential election. Now Ramnath Kovind, he was the 15th president of India. Now as the citizens of India, we are electing our 16th president. Okay. So let us see who will be the you know winner in this election process. Okay. This election will be held on 18th July. Election for the post will be held on the 18th July, and the result will be declared on the 21st July. So if you look into this. Now, the new presidential candidate will be elected or he will be selected before the end of the term of the present president. His term will end on the 24th July, but before 24th July itself we will be having the new president. Okay. So this was the news. So because of ne this news article, uh, it, ha it will become you know, very important for our studies to understand the election process of the president of India. Okay. As you all know, India is a republican state. That means in the uh, preamble to the constitution of India, there are various terms. One of those terms is the, the republic. What do you mean by the republic? This word is the combination of two words, re and public. Right? Re and public. What is this re and what is the public? Both of these terms combined will make the term called the republic. But let us split and understand the meaning of this. Re and public. That means the publics, the public are represented indirectly. It is the indirect representation of the people. We the democratic, we are the democratic country, right? We the people of India have adopted the constitution that has provided for the democratic form of governance in India, right? Democracy means it is the rule of the people of the people, by the people and for the people. You know it very well. But all these people should be represented, right? These all the crores of people, we are the 130 crore uh, uh, populated country, right? So many people are there. So all these people are represented uh, in, a, in our democratic setup. But one, there, is, there will be only one person to represent all these people. We as the people, as the country, all the 30, 130 crore people cannot be represented at the apex level of the governance, right? See, uh, we will have the some mechanisms. We have some mechanisms through that mechanism at the apex of the governance. We will be having only one person amongst the uh, our uh, own population, right? So when the top level of the governance is represented by the person who in turn represents the people, such a form of governance is called as the republican form of governance, okay? You are very well aware that there are different types of governances, right? There is a uh, communism form of uh, governance, is a, okay, right? Uh, communism form of governance, republican form of governance, monarchical form of governance, right? Authoritarian form of governance, different oligarchies are there, various types of governance are there, but we have the republican form of governance. That means we the people are represented by a single person at the top level of the governance. Okay. The official name of the country, you know, uh, very often we call it as India, India, government of India or the state of India. But what is the exact official name of India? 
the official name is the republic of india okay this is the uh, uh, formal name of the country republic of india in hindi it is called as the bharat ganarajya right it is the bharat ganarajya that means union of the states some countries have monarchical form of government see as of now uh, the best example for monarchical form of government government governance is the united kingdom in the united kingdom the government or the whole country is represented by a hereditary monarch that is the queen queen is the head of the state okay uh, all the affairs of the state are conducted uh, in her name right wherever the you know country goes in the different forums like uh, world economic forum or anywhere else or even in the united nations that country will be that country's affairs will be conducted in the name of the queen of the england that is this is the monarchical form of government this monarchy or the queen is the hereditary head of the state but in india where the democratic country we will be having the the person who is elected by the people right the people are not directly electing the president but president is elected indirectly by the people okay here uh, let us try to understand in detail who is the president what are his roles and what kind of you know responsibilities who he will be having in the indian uh, political setup okay so he is the first, first citizen of india in the order of preferences or in the order of hierarchy of governance president will be at the top level all the government officials or the even he, he might be the prime minister or vice president or speaker governor chief ministers all of these people who have the who are the constitutional heads all of them them will be below the president of india he is the topmost government official in the country right he represent the highest body of governance in the country that is why he is called as the first citizen of india right now he acts as the symbol of unity integrity and solidi solidarity of the nation as i said we are the democratic country and we all the people are represented by one single person that is the president in that way he is the symbol of unity he represents the unity of the people of all the people of india okay he represents the integrity right integrity means we uh, we have the different cultures within india we have different races we have different religions we have different languages r various kind of differences are there even with having so many differences we are the united people we are the integrated people right that integrity is represented by the president of india because people belonging to the different uh, backgrounds having different religions language race place different uh, uh, variety of you know backgrounds are there for the people all these people will come together and they will elect their representatives in turn these representatives like mps and the mlas they will elect the president in that way he is the symbol of integrity of the whole india okay he is the even the symbol of solidarity of the india solidarity means firmness he represents the country as a whole okay solidarity see uh, unity among the people okay he is the symbol of all these things now he is the supreme commander of the armed forces we you know uh, it very well that we have the different kind of forces in india uh, among them three are very very important right uh, air force is there land force is there naval force is there all these three forces are there and the all these military forces they are put under the control of the civilian government right this president is the head of the government and in turn he controls the all the armies in india army whether it is army navy or air force all these different forces of defense they are put under the presidential control that means we the people of india have the sovereign control over the armed forces even if the country wants to wage the war against a country another country or the india if it wants to conclude a peace treaty all these acts are done by the president of india or in his name and uh, in the name of president of india the government will conclude the treaty or it will wage a war against another country see in that way he is the supreme commander that means he can give the orders to the armed forces to wage the war the different heads of the uh, uh, different forces like admiral is there air chief marshal is there generals are there 
these people they themselves cannot wage the war against another country though they might be the head of the different armed force but they do not have the power to uh, you know uh, start the war that warning or that beginning of the war warning or the the command should come from the president of india in that way he is the supreme commander right he is the supreme con commander of the all the armed forces in india okay let us look into the constitutional provision of the office of president if you look into the article 52 this in the article 52 it is enshrined that there shall be a president of india see this terminology or this phrase has very uh, no big meaning there shall be a president of india that means at even at any given point of time in india in the office of president there should always be the president the office of president should not be vacant even for a single minutes even for a single minute this office should not be vacant this is the main you no know, theme of the article 52 that means there should be a continuous president of india there should not be any interregnum or there should not be any gap between the election of two presidents okay so this is the article 52 now the president of india again uh, this article 52 is the part of the part of five okay so the constitution of india has various parts right from part one to part 22 23 there are uh, some additional parts are also there total there are 25 parts in the constitution of india one of the such parts is the part fifth or the part five of the constitution this part consists of the articles from 52 to 151 all these articles they deal with the the union uh, the union government right that is the central government the central government it derives all its powers or are the roles or it has some of the functions that are enshrined in the constitution all that those you know uh, items are the functions can be found in the articles from 52 to 151 so within this part 5 or within this part 5 there is a first chapter there are various chapters under the part, part 5 of the constitution the first chapter will deal with the the union executive right what do you mean by the union executive see this constitution again has given birth to the three wings of the government right three wings of the state executive wing legislative wing and judicial wing okay see at the uh, in the executive sphere we have dual polity that means we have the two systems of executives one at the central level and another one at the state level we have the dual polity right at the two levels we have the executives one is the state executive and another one is the union executive the chapter one under the part five of the constitution deals with the union executive this union executive is cons consisting of various officials right you see this is the combination of the officers in the union executive right this union executive consists of the president vice president prime minister council of ministers and attorney general of india all these you know five group of you know people that is president vice president prime minister council of ministers and the attorney general of india these five categories of people will make the union executive see if you look uh, very keenly into this president is the part of union executive right though he is the part of union executive he is the de jure executive right there are two types of executives in our parliamentary system of governance right one executive is called as the de jure executive right de jure executive and one more is de facto executive what do you mean by this de jure executive de jure executive is nothing but he is the nominal head of the state or he is the nominal executive of the state okay he is also called as the titular head of the state right Nom nominal head of the state or the titular head of the state that means this executive's function that is the de jure executive his functions are nominal in nature 
right they are titular in nature or they are just ceremonial in nature see this is the meaning of de jure executive this de jure de jure executive is none other than the president of india there is one more term called the de facto executive who is this de facto executive he is the real executive of the country he is the real executive of the government right he is the real head right de facto executive is the real head he has the lot of powers in actual right though the president of india is the highest officer under the administrative setup he has the nominal powers but if you look into the real powers the prime minister of india has the too much powers compared to the president of india in that way he is the real executive of the state okay see president is the head of the state there are again two terms head of the state and the head of the government right prime minister is the head of the government because this prime minister is coming from the the party which is in power right this party is ruling the whole country right the prime minister he represents the party so in that way he is the head of the government that means he is heading the government at the central level at the union executive we saw that there are uh, different officials like president prime minister vice president right council of ministers and the attorney general among all of them the prime minister is the head of the state this all union executives you know functions are headed by the uh, prime minister he is the head of the council of ministers in our democratic system in our parliamentary form of governance the council of ministers is the core at okay it is at the center of the uh, at par parliamentary system of governance but this council of ministers is headed by the prime minister right in that way he is the head of the government right but the president whenever india goes uh, in the meetings like united nations meeting or world economic forum or in the asean or in the other summits whenever the government goes and represents india there the name of the president is mentioned see india will be uh, all the you know uh, negotiations or peace treaties or any of the agreements they are conducted in the name of the president right he is all the executive actions of the state that is the india is you know uh, they are con conducted or concluded under the name of the president of republic of okay now we saw uh, just we you know saw that india is going to elect its new president why it is electing the new president because there is a vacancy there there will be you know upcoming vacancy in the uh, post or in the office of the president of india see i saw uh, sorry i i said that uh, according to article 52 there should not be any interregnum that means there should not be any gap in the post uh, in the office of the president of india to fill that gap or to fill that vacancy now we are going to elect our new president right because the present uh, present incumbent president's tenure is ending see according to the constitutional provisions uh, in india the president's term of office is only 5 years okay after every 5 years we must elect the new president okay before the expiry of the 5 years we must elect the new president okay uh, there are uh, four five conditions in which the office of president will fall vacant okay what are those five provisions one is the expiry expiry of his tenure once the five year term is expired the office of president will become vacant one case by the resignation of the present sitting president if the sitting president is uh, has resigned from his post there the vacancy will arise then if the sitting president is removed by the process of impeachment then again the vacancy will arise in the you know office of the president if the sitting president dies in the office again the you know office will become vacant otherwise uh, or otherwise the constitution has mentioned the term otherwise this otherwise means if the sitting you know president is disqualified okay if he is disqualified to hold the office or if his election is declared void see there are various qualifications to become the president of india if the present sitting you know president is not you know qualified to become the such person he can be disqualified according to the provisions of the constitution or if an elect a president is elected based on the some irregularity the irregularities in the election process then uh, if the election process is you know uh, found to be 
uh, irregularly conducted, he can be declared, you know, disqualified. See, based on these, you know, conditions, the President of India office will become vacant. To fill this vacancy, we have to elect the new President as early as possible. Right? Okay. When, how, I mean, when we have to elect the President, there are again some of the provisions. Okay. Elections to fill the vacancy. In case of expiry of the five-year term, when we will conduct the elections? First case, in case of expiry of the five-year term, if the present sitting president's term is over, then we'll go for the elections. Okay. In case of any delay in conducting the election, outgoing president continues until his successor assumes the charge. That means present, we, presently we have the Ramanath Kovind as the president of India. His term is ending on the 24th July of 2022. But by any other reasons, the, if the election commission of India is not holding the elections to the post of a president, the present president, that is Ramanath Kovind, will continue in his office till the next president is elected. Though the constitution has fixed the term of five years, uh, okay, if there is no elections to the next uh, you know, uh, president, the present president will continue in, in his office till the next uh, pre new president is elected. Okay, this is the one pr uh, provision. But when the uh, sitting president continues in, in his office beyond his five-year term, even that is the case, in such conditions, the vice president cannot become the president of India. You know it very well that there is a president below him, there is vice president. You might be thinking that if the term of president office is over, vice president will assume the office. No, it is not the case. Vice president will never become the president when the term of the sitting pr president is expired. Okay. Uh, though it is expired, the sitting president will continue till the next president is elected. Okay. So here, uh, the vice president will never get a chance to serve as the president of India. Second chance, uh, I mean, second case where the vacancy arises, if the office of the president falls vacant by resignation, by removal, by death or otherwise. So this removal is nothing but the impeachment of the president. The present office will become vacant when uh, the sitting president re resigns by writing the letter to the vice president. The president resigns by writing the letter to the vice president. Okay, don't confuse. He will not write the resignation letter to the prime minister. He will address the resignation letter to the vice president. Okay, this is resignation. If the president is impeached, okay, then the vacancy arises or if he dies or Otherwise, that means if he has involved in the elect electoral malpractices or if he is found to be disqualified to be the president, the vacancy will arise. In such you know, uh, cases, if the office has become vacant because of these conditions, the elections must be held within six months, right? That is within 180 days or the before expiry of the six months, okay? Once the vacancy has arised because of these conditions, the next elections must be held within you know, six months, right? Otherwise, what happens during these six months, if the present, you know, president dies or he resigns, during these conditions only, vice president can become the president, right? In case of expiry of the ter uh, term of five years, the vice president will not become the president. But when there is a vacancy due to the death or resignation or impeachment or otherwise, the vice president can become the president of India, okay? Only for six months, because within this six months, the new president must be elected, right? That newly elected president will serve another full year, a full term of five years, right? This is the only case when the vice president can become the president. There is another case, if the present sitting vice, sorry, president is unable to discharge his duties because of the some health conditions or because of any other reasons, the president is not able to discharge his duties, vice president can assume the role of a president and he can become the president till the uh, president is recovered. Okay, then the president will come back and vice president will assume his vice presidential role. Okay, these are the only inst two instances when the vice president can become the president. Okay. Next, I said uh, if the uh, office becomes vacant due to that death or resignation or okay, uh, impeachment, vice president will become the president. But what if there is no vice president? 
by chance if there is no vice president in the office of vice president who will become the president then uh, the person who is the chief justice of india he will become the president of india even if the chief justice of india is not there in his case, in his place who whosoever is the senior most judge in the supreme court he will become the president of india okay next what are the qualifications to become the president of india who can become the uh, president of india okay there are five, four you know uh, qualifications one is the citizen of india whosoever is the president uh, sorry citizen of india he can become the president okay invariably he must be the citizen of india the if the person is coming from another country and if he is residing here no he can never become the president of india he must be the naturally born citizen of india next he must be having the age of 35 years he must have completed the minimum 35 years of age then only he can become the president then he should qualify the conditions to be elected as the member of lok sabha see there are uh, under the representation of people act 1951 and other uh, under the various provisions of the constitution there are some conditions if the person who has completed the age of 35 year and who is the citizen of india if he also meets the conditions enshrined in the uh, representation of people act 1951 and the constitution then he can also become the president of india then he should not hold any office of profit this is very important any office of profit under the union government or state government or any other local authority right or any other public authority see there are in in, in indian democratic set, setup we have the three tier of governance at the apex there is uh, union government at the middle level there, is, there are state governments and at the lowest level or at the third tier we have the local bodies called the gram panch uh, sorry panchayats or the urban local bodies see any of the person who is contesting for the post of president he should not be holding any of the offices at these three of uh, all these three levels okay even any of the office who is you know sub substantially funded by the government it will become the public authority even the person should not be holding any office under these you know public authorities that means he should not be deriving any profit from the office which is under the government right he might be the businessman he can he might be earning his own income uh, even he might be earning the lakhs or crores of rupees he can become the president but he should not be holding any uh, income generating office under the government right these are the few conditions uh, which are prescribed in the constitution the president or the presidential candidate must fulfill all of these conditions then he can become uh, qualified to become the president of india next how the elections are conducted we know that uh, we know now the qualifications to become the president and uh, uh, what is the role of president and all but what is the election process how the uh, uh, president is elected let us look into that aspect okay first the candidate has to file the nomination papers right uh, i can stand for the uh, election of you know uh, president of the india right any of the citizen of india can become the president right if i want to become the president of india i have to fill the nomination papers this nomination process, uh, paper or uh, me as a candidate should be supported by 50 members as the proposers and the 50 members as the seconders that means there is a electoral college i said uh, the president of india is indirectly elected that means people will elect the mlas and mps and these mlas and mps in turn will elect the president but the candidate who is select or who is standing for the elections he must be supported by 50 proposers and 50 seconders these proposers and seconders are none other than the mps and mlas each candidate who is standing for the election he should have the backup of 50 proposers right plus 50 seconders these are none other than mps and mlas then an elector cannot propose or second the nomination of more than one candidate see in india we have more than 4000 uh, MPs and MLAs. That means there are 777 elected MPs are there in the parliament. Uh, plus there are 4,000 plus MLAs are there. All of these people will become the electors for the post of uh, in the election process of the uh, president. But all of these people they can propose only one candidate. As a as an elector, I can propose one candidate. I cannot. I should not. You know, propose or I should not become the secondary supporter for the more than one candidates. Right? These are the conditions. The rule for securing the fifty proposers and fifty seconders was implemented by the Election Commission of India in the year 
1974. That means I said anyone can become the president of India, and we can we will be having high desires to you know head the post of the president, right? See, this is the natural desire for any of the citizen of India. But what if all the you know citizens of India come and they contest for the election, right? It should be avoided. It will become too cumbersome process for the election com uh, commission of India to process all the files and all. See, because of to uh, to avoid such you know uh, incident, it has implemented the this condition that is 50 proposers and 50 seconders see uh, these mlas and mps they will support the candidates right uh, so that the election process will become very easy so this was implemented in the year 1974 then the candidate who is you know, standing for the election he should deposit some money right the constitution says that the person who is standing for the election, he should deposit 15,000 rupees in the account of Reserve Bank of India, right? In the Reserve Bank of India, me as a candidate of the presidential uh, election, I should deposit 15,000 rupees uh, as a security deposit, right? Uh, the, uh, the term is deposit. That means it will be given back to the candidate. But only when there is a condition, if the candidate secures more than one sixth of the total valid votes polled then his security amount will be given back to the candidate right whether he wins the election or you know loses the election that does not matter but he should secure more than one sixth of the votes polled in the election then only his 15000 rupees will be given back otherwise it will be forfeited by the election commission of india okay uh, so this is the security uh, deposit in the election process then what is the election principle on what basis this election is you know held see there is a principle called proportional representation by means of single transferable vote right this system of election is through the secret ballot see there are three terms very important terms proportional representation okay proportional representation single transferable vote and secret ballot so in the Raj Sabha election it is called as the open ballot system to elect the Raj Sabha MPs, the candidate who the electors they will you know mark the ballot and they will show the ballot paper to the authorized person in the elect election booth. But in the presidential election, it is the secret ballot system. We will discuss in detail about the proportional representation and single transferable vote uh, after some time. Okay. Why this system has been introduced? Why proportional representation by means of single transferable vote? Because it will ensure the absolute majority of the votes the candidate who is selected by the electoral college of the uh, presidential election the, he should enjoy the absolute majority that means he should enjoy the more than 50 percent of the votes polled so to uh, achieve this absolute majority we have introduced the proportional representation by means of single transferable vote okay but this is not possible absolute majority getting the absolute majority is not possible if it is the uh, universal adult franchise okay we'll come to uh, that point later then electoral college what is the electoral college that means who elects the president of india i am very often telling that mps and mlas will elect the president of india but what kind of mps and mlas there are various mlas like nominated mlas are there directly elected mlas are there nominated mps and directly elected mps are there but who among these people will elect uh, the president let us look into it the electoral college consists of the elected members of the both the houses of the parliament in the parliamentary setup we have two houses right it, we have the bicameral legislature one is upper house and one is lower house that is Raj Sabha and Lok Sabha the members who belong to both the houses who are especially elected right they can become part of this electoral college the elected members of the state legislative assemblies that means MLAs of the states right then elected members of the legislative assemblies of the union territories of Delhi, Puducherry, and very recently the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. The Union Territories which have the legislative assemblies, okay, in that assembly there are MLAs. Those MLAs, especially the elected MLAs, can become the participants in the electoral college. But if you please look into this aspect, it is very important. The electoral college will not consist of, okay it does not consist of some of the members see you, you look into these things elected mps of the both houses of parliament el elected mlas of the states elected mls of the union territories having the legislative assemblies all these people are the elected directly by the people but if you look into the
Perfect. This elect electoral college will not consist of the following type of members. What kind of members? Nominated members. There will be nominated members in the state legislative assemblies. There are nominated members in the Rajya Sabha and even in the Lok Sabha. Right? There are nominated members in the assemblies of the union territories. See, earlier there was a, a, pro a provision for the nomination of the people belonging to the Anglo-Indian community. But because of the recent uh, amendment to the constitution, this provision has been removed. There is no nominated member in the Lok Sabha. But in the Rajya Sabha, uh, even in the Anglo-Indian communities, uh, this provision has been removed in the legislative assemblies also. That means in the Lok Sabha and in the state legislative assemblies, there are no uh, nominated members. But Rajya Sabha has their uh, nominated members. Uh, we, uh, we have the total strength of 245. As of now, we have the 245 members uh, strong Rajya Sabha, right? Among these 245, 233 are directly elected by the M uh, sorry, MPs and oh, sorry, MLAs of the state. But there are 12 members right 233 plus 12 means 245 we have total 245 Raj Sabha members among them 12 are nominated you know it very well that the president will appoint or nominate the persons who have the specialized knowledge in the field of literature science social science and arts okay if they have the specialized knowledge the president will appoint or nominate them as the members of the parliament in the Rajya Sabha okay these people these nominated MPs in the Rajya Sabha will not you know participate in the election of the president right okay nominated members of the state legislative assemblies uh, nominated members of the uh, union territories right these nominated members will never participate in the election process of the president but if you look into another aspect, these nominated members will, are not participating in the elect, uh, election of the president, but they will become the participants in the impeachment of the president. Okay, this is very interesting fact. Please remember that. Now, as per the current estimates, uh, uh, the electoral college consists of how many MLAs are there, how many MPs are there. Let us look into uh, it. Okay, presently we have 245 members in the Lok Sabha. We have 233 elected members in the Rajya Sabha. Okay, please you know, uh, make it a point that these are the elected members in the Rajya Sabha. But there are 4,033 MLAs in the different states and the union territories. See, if you uh, you know add all these figures, we will get the total 4,809 electors. That means 4,809 participants in the electoral college okay all these people are the representatives of people they will participate in the election of the president of india okay now the value of votes of mps and mla i said the president of uh, india india's election process is based on the proportional representation right that means these mlas and mps they, are, they will elect the president based on the proportion of the people. Uh, these are the people's representatives. They are representing certain proportion of the people, right? See, that is why it is called proportional representation. But each MPs and MLAs vote is not ca calculated on a single basis. That means it is not counted as the one vote, right? Instead of you know counting one uh, vote as a single vote, the value of the vote will be determined, right? See, because they are, you know, representing the people, this representation will be, you know, analyzed in the values. It is called as the vote value or value of the vote. Instead of uh, taking, you know, MPs or MLA vote as the single vote, it will be converted into value, right? Why this, you know, uh, value of vote is obtained? What is the me, you know, uh, need for it? Because to achieve the parity between the states, as the whole and the union government because here MPs and MLAs both are you know participating in the election there should not be any disparity between MLAs and MPs they should be having the equal basis or equal platform while electing the president of India one to achieve the uniformity in the scale of representation of the different states you know it very well that uh, in India we have different sized territorially there are different sized you know, states uh, demographically there are different sized states that means different states have different number of people that means population varies from state to state but to achieve the uniformity see if you look into the formulas whatever I give in the next slides if you look into it each and every MLA will be representing a same number of people okay in that way it is the proportional representation to achieve the uniformity in the scale of representation of the states we have the uh, the finding the va uh, value of the votes of the MPs and the MLAs. Now, please look into it. This is the value of vote of MLA. 
what is the value of vote of one MLA? This will be determined based on the total population of the state. Okay. Now we'll take into account the total population of the state. This population will be divided by uh, total number of elected MLAs in the assembly. Right. Value of the vote of M MLA is equal to total population of the state divided by total number of the elected members in the state assem uh, legislative assembly. This value will be divided by uh, 1000. That means uh, uh, this will be too much. See, in the particular state like, uh, let us say Karnataka, we have the 6 crore people. Okay, 6 crore if it is divided by 224 in Karnataka, we have 224 MLA is in the state assembly, right? See, if you divide the 6 crore by 224, the number will be too much, right? It will be in the crores or in the uh, lakhs. To avoid the such a big number, we will calculate it by the 1000, okay? So, we will get one value, okay? That, that, that will give the value of one vote of the MLA. See, this value of vote of one MLA, it will vary from state to state. Right, because every state has the different population, every state has the different strength of the assembly. In the assembly, uh, in some of the state assembly uh, is having less than 40 MLAs, in some of the states like Uttar Pradesh, they have more than 200 MLAs. That means the strength of the MLAs also varies and the total size of the population varies from state to state. That is why the value of vote of one MLA will va vary from state to state. Right. <coughs> Now, now, I am telling that the population of the state is considered, but what is the base year for this uh, population? The census, uh, the census data will be referred by the Election Commission of India. But what census is considered? Uh, uh, by nature, a very recent uh, census must be considered to get these numbers. But what is happening? Uh, through the 84th Amendment Act of 2001, immediately after the 2001 decadal census, there was one amendment to the constitution and it said that it has fixed the population. Okay, So, the population figures of 1971 should be considered for the determining the vote of MLAs. Okay, But this will change. The uh, after 2006-26, see this amendment says that uh, as of now, till the 2026, the population which is based on the 1971 census will be considered for calculating these figures. But after 2026, again, uh, the base year will become the 2031 because after 2026, new census year will be 2031, right? So that will be considered. This will change. Now, uh, the vote of value of each MLA is different from state to state. I have experience, uh, explained this. See, if you look into this, you can say the value of vote of one MLA in Uttar Pradesh is it is 208. In Tamil Nadu and Jharkhand, it is equal. That is 176. In Maharashtra, it is 175. And in the very uh, 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 states like Arunachala Pradesh, where the population is very uh, rare or very scarce, there the value of MLA's vote will be very only 8. Okay. So, this is, this is the value of vote of MLA. Then we have to determine the value of vote of MPs also. I, I said we have to make the parity between the states as a whole and the union government as the whole. So to come to this parity, we have to determine the value of the each MP also. How this MP's uh, vote's value is determined? Uh, let, let us look into this formula. The value of the vote of an MP is equal to the total value of votes of all the MLAs of all the states. See, we have saw in the previous slide that uh, in the Uttar Pradesh, 208 uh, vote value is there. In Tamil Nadu and Jharkhand, it is 176, right? So in Arunachal Pradesh, it is 8. See, if you combine all the values of all the MP, sorry, MLAs in the country, so it will be in the uh, this place, okay? This, you know, total value of all the MP, uh, MLAs, it will be divided by the total number of elected MPs in the parliament, right? How many elected MPs are there? See, 543 in the... <coughs> 543 MPs in the Lok Sabha, right? 233 MPs in the Raj Sabha. So, if you add these numbers, you will get the 776. There are 776 MPs in the parliament. See, the total value of votes of all the MLAs, it will be divided by 776, right? We will get one figure. That figure gives you the total value of the vote of one MP. Okay. See, after, you know, calculating all these things, now again, we'll come to the electoral quota. That is different thing. We'll look into that also. See, so if you get this, see, because there are fixed number of MLAs, there are fixed number of elected MPs in the parliament. See, by, you know, uh, looking into it, we'll get the equal number of the vote of uh, each MP will be the value of vote of each MP is 708. Okay. Then, 
but this value of vote of mp will reduce this year it will become 700 because uh, we know uh, the statehood of jammu and kashmir has been cancelled now jammu and kashmir has been you know divided into two union territories right union territory of jammu kashmir has the assembly but the union territory of ladakh doesn't have the assembly because of the lack of assembly still the assembly is not constituted in the jammu and kashmir because of this lack of constitution of the uh, legislative assembly in the union territory of jammu and kashmir the vote of ml sorry mp will come down to 700 from 708 in the 2002 presidential election right Though the value of MLAs vary from state to state, but the value of vote of MPs will be, will be similar, right? It will not vary. Whether the MP is from Rajya Sabha or Lok Sabha, that does not matter, but the value will be equal for all the MPs. Now, we will look into the electoral quota. What is this electoral quota? The quota means the, the candidate, you know, uh, uh, to be declared as the winner, he should secure the minimum electoral quota. What is this electoral quota? Again, there is a formula. Electoral quota is equal to total number of valid votes polled. Whatever these MPs and MLAs, they are you now exercising the, their franchise, right? All the values of such MLAs and MPs will be uh, considered. Those are the valid votes, okay? But that will be divided by 2. That means 50% of total value of the valid votes polled plus one that means it will give the absolute majority that means more than 50 percent of the total valid votes polled so in that in this way uh, the candidate who is going to be declared as the winner will secure the absolute vote that means more than 50 percent of the votes but see if you look into deeper aspect of this it is very difficult to do to get such an absolute number if it is direct election to the post of president okay because of this we have introduced the ind indirect system that is proportional representation system now uh, after you know adding all the values of the uh, votes of MPs and MLA, you will get the 10,86,431. This is the total value of the all the votes of the MPs and MLAs. The, let us consider that all the MPs and MLAs votes will be valid. See, they will remove the invalid votes. Let us assume that all the valid votes are there in the presidential election. The person who gets 50% of this, that means uh, uh, roughly around 5 lakh. Uh, 43,215, right? So, this is the, uh, if you uh, yeah, no, uh, apply this formula to this figure, you will get the 5,43,215 plus 1, this plus 1. The person who gets the 5,43,216 votes, he will be declared as the president of India, okay? This is the required electoral quota. Any person, uh, contesting candidate must secure this number. Otherwise, uh, the election will become difficult, right? This is the electoral quota. Now, term of office of president. How long the elected president will remain in office? The constitution says that the term of office of president is five years normally. But the present president is sitting in the office, his term is ending, but the election is not decided yet. Because of this, some difficulty, Election Commission of India might tell that it is difficult to hold the election for the president of India. Then during that time, the president can continue in office. That means beyond five-year term, he can continue, right? <coughs> but again, he sits in the office after completion of this, this is the same point, then he can also be re-elected and there is no cap on his re-election. The President Kovind is there presently. Let us assume that he has completed his term. Now he can become n number of times the President of India. He can become three times, four times or five times or till his death, he can become the President of India, right? He can be re-elected. That means he can be, after every five years, he can be re-elected. There is no, you know, um, gap on the uh, number of times a person can become president, okay? There is no ceiling limit for the number of times to become president. Then oath or affirmation of the president. Uh, once the election, uh, sorry, president is elected, he will enter into his office. Before entering into his office, he has to subscribe to an oath or he has to make one oath. This oath is administered by the Chief Justice of India. If the Chief Justice of India is absent during the oath taking ceremony of the President, any senior most uh, judge in the Supreme Court can administer the oath of office to the President. Then what are the you know uh, provisions included in this oath? What kind of oath the President takes? Let us look into that. 
See, he will take in his uh, in his oath. He will swears that that means he affirms, sir. He will promise that he will faithfully execute the office because this post is based on the trust of the people. He is enjoying the lot of trust of the people because uh, to uh, to value that uh, trust, he will execute all his functions very faithfully. That means this is faith and allegiance to the constitution as well as to the sovereign body that is people of india okay he will enjoy the faith then he will swear that to preserve protect and defend the constitution and the laws of the country this is very important he cannot because he is the more powerful you know person in the country now he is the first citizen there is no one else above him right he can exercise any of the powers but he cannot do any such whims and uh, fancies of his mind he cannot exercise his whims and fancies but he will be abiding by the constitution and laws of the uh, parliament whatever the central government does or enacts the laws he will be you know uh, protecting those laws he will preserving them and he will defend them at any cost he will defend the you know laws of the parliament as well as the constitution he is the protector or the uh, defender of the constitution of india no doubt the supreme court is also the interpreter of the supreme court during some of the writ cases it is also a defender of the constitution but if you look into this oath of office the president is the defender of the constitution and laws of the state then he will devote himself to the service and well-being of the people of india he cannot you know you know uh, he he cannot uh, serve his own purposes he will serve the public purposes only right these are the terms sorry uh, uh, terminologies involved in the oath or affirmation of the president of india okay <coughs> then this is administered by chief justice of india otherwise any senior most judge of the supreme court any other person sometimes i said he uh, during the death or resignation or impeachment or uh, uh, expiry of the five year term any person can become the president any person means vice president or chief justice of india or senior most judge in the supreme court they can become the president during certain conditions but when these other persons enter the president's office before entering into that of they have to subscribe to the oath or affirmations he they have to you know say these say these words or they have to promise these words then only they they will become eligible to hold the office of president right then disputes related to the election of president now we saw that there are uh, 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 electoral college there are electors are there mps are mlas uh, once uh, the uh, sometimes there will be some disputes there will be validity or invalidity of the vote or sometimes the unqualified person may be contesting the election right uh, uh, all such matters or all such disputes or all such cases can be heard only in the supreme court supreme court is the only you know supreme authority to hear the matters related to the di disputes uh, during the election of the president then uh, there is no appeal against the order of the supreme court whatever the supreme court says whatever the verdict it gives in these cases that is final there is no uh, appeal against the order given by the supreme court during the presidential election disputes right after the election of president is declared null and void the acts done by the president in his office remain valid even after his removal see uh, some let us say that a person x is elected to the president of india he has served for uh, let us say four years right for four years he was holding the office of president but after four years what happens uh, one case is filed in the supreme court and the supreme court files uh, finds that the election process was you know irregular there were some irregularities in the uh, election process or uh, he this person x was not having the proper qualifications to become the president then now what happens this person must be disqualified right when he is disqualified he will be removed out of the office but whatever he has done for four years in the capacity of the president of india they will be valid okay they cannot be declared null and void okay only the candidate is declared uh, unqualified but whatever the actions he has done for four years they are valid okay this is very important then why the president of india is elected indirectly he might have been elected directly by the people right but why this office has been made as the indirect office let us look into it he is the nominal head i said i have given two words de jure executive and 
nominal executive or de facto executive de facto and de jure he is the de jure head of the state that means he is the nominal head whatever the government does all its actions are all executive actions of the government are you know held under the name of president he is just a ceremonial head there is no real powers for the president that is why no direct election otherwise what happens it will become the rival center of power press prime minister you know more powerful a post is their prime minister but again if the people directly elect the president of india what happens there will be rivalry between the posts of president and the prime minister these people will be fighting i am supreme and i am supreme the conflict will arise to prevent that conflict it is made indirect election then what happens uh, if the president is you know um, elect uh, sorry contesting based on the party lines uh, that means this is the highest office there should not be any political influence in this office right uh, to prevent the any political influence this has been made indirect election right then it saves the time logistics resources energy and the money if you look into the general election once in the, which are held once in 5 years or if you look into the state legislative assemblies there is enormous amount of resources being you know uh, spent whether it is a police force whether it is a teachers Uh, whether it is the returning officers all the machineries of the government are you know used to conduct the elections too much of money is spent right too much of resources are spent too much of logistics that means transport vehicles papers everything is involved but again already there are direct elections in the states and the for the uh, lok sabha elections but again one more person is directly elected what what does it mean to wastage of resources right to prevent that wastage this is made indirect election then framers of the constitution this was the main aim of the constitution so constitution framers that is father of fathers of the constitution they said that they wanted the power of the government to reside in the council of ministers and the legislature right india is a parliamentary system if you look into the article 74 especially and 163 Uh, this is at the central level this is at the state level see article 74 and 75 they create the parliamentary system of governance what is this parliamentary system of governance that means there is there will be council of ministers headed by the prime minister this body or the council of minister will aid and advise the president the president is bound to act according to the aid and advice given by the council of ministers headed by the prime minister otherwise the actions of the president who which are you know uh which which have been done in his own capacity they will not be valid the president must act according to the aid and advice given by the council of ministers this was the main uh, aim of the constitution framers right because of these provisions the uh, presidential post has been made to be elected indirectly okay these are the very important points related to the president of india's election process okay uh, we will meet in the next class till then bye bye